Welcome everyone to the second HAI research seminar of the academic year. I'm Russell Wald, Director of Policy here at Stanford HAI. Before we begin the presentation and introduction of my colleagues, a few logistical notes. You can use the QR code on the screen or the link that will be shared in the chat to ask questions, questions through Slido. After the presentation, there will be time for Q&A and we look forward to your thoughtful questions. Today's seminar is titled, A Blueprint for a National Research Cloud. And we plan on sharing some of our key findings from our report released this morning titled, Building a National AI Research Resource, A Blueprint for a National Research Cloud. This white paper culminates nearly 10 months of investigation on how the US can architect a computing resource and design a data commons for a national research cloud. You can access the report in our chat box or by visiting Hai's webpage. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to take a few minutes to sketch out today's seminar and introduce my co-presenters. I'll start by laying out the origins of the National Research Cloud, NRC for short, followed by the more academic theory of the case for the NRC. Then my co-presenter, Professor Dan Ho, will describe our analysis in infrastructure, eligibility, and allocation for computing. Dan is the William Benjamin Scott and Luna M. Scott of Law and a professor of political science here at Stanford. He is also an associate director at HAI. Jen King will then follow with a presentation on the organizational form, data access, and privacy of the NRC. Dr. King is the Privacy and Data Policy Fellow at HAI and previously was the Director of Consumer Privacy at the Center for Internet and Society at Stanford Law School. Finally, Chris Wan will conclude by speaking to the ethics and intellectual property concerns of the NRC. Chris is a JD MBA candidate at Stanford University. He served as a teaching assistant for the course, Creating a National Research Cloud, and is a co-author of the report tied to this seminar. Before, we formally, uh, before formally outlining our research findings, I'm going to start with a brief overview on how HAI championed the NRC and then provide our theory of the case as to why we believe not only US academics would benefit from such an infrastructure, but downstream effects that could positively impact the economy. In late 2019, HAI co-directors Fei-Fei Li and John Etchmendy recognized a growing imbalance in AI research with a greater tilt towards commercialization and less on basic science research. As I'll explain later in this section, a primary reason for this, for the lack of, a primary reason for this is the lack of resources available to academic researchers compared to industry. High's core mission is to promote human-centered AI, which fundamentally requires broadening who has access, input, and oversight of AI resources. And so to this challenge, Feifei and Etchmendi proposed the concept of having the federal government architect a cloud, utilizing government-held data sets, and making them available to nonprofit researchers, what they called a national research cloud. In early 2020, Feifei and Etchmendi began to socialize the concept with various groups, including computer science universities, in March of 2022, 22 presidents and provosts of the top 30 computer science universities proposed in an open letter to the Congress and president a federal task force to study the concept of a national research cloud. Shortly after the, after the call for the task force, the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence endorsed the concept of the NRC in their first set of recommendations, to which they noted the aforementioned imbalance in the AI innovation ecosystem and how it threatens to stagnate US economic and techn technological competitiveness. This led to the drafting of the National AI Research Resource Task Force Act of 2020, legislation that passed in January of this year. A federal task force has now been established with representatives from academia, civil society, government, and industry. This task force will determine the best pathway forward to an NRC with a final report deliver, delivered to the Congress and President in the fall of 2022. And for my colleagues presenting with me today, this is where our academic journey began. 
To jumpstart the task force's work, Stanford Law School and HAI partnered to host a policy practicum titled On Creating a National Research Cloud. The practicum drew graduate students, researchers, and faculty across engineering, computer science, law, and economic and policy backgrounds to conduct an exhaustive study on precisely how the United States can create, implement, and maintain an NRC. This morning's release of our white paper, along with this presentation, represents the most comprehensive study to date on an NRC, to which we are beyond grateful to the students on the, uh, this project, as well as the guest lecturers and interviewees that provided expert advice. To start with the theory of the case as to why an NRC is recommended, we need to understand that there are inherent differences between academic research and commercialized research. With longer time horizons and no profit constraints, basic scientific research has given way to breakthroughs such as GPS, the internet, and CRISPR. Examples such as this have led to an, have led to an uh, eventual commercialization of these discoveries and greater downstream benefits to society. If indeed there is an imbalance occurring in the AI innovation ecosystem, AI research will disproportionately focus on short-term commercial applications without ensuring the long-term innovation across fields. Historically, the US innovation ecosystem has been anchored by partnership between government, universities, and industry. In AI, for example, according to a recent study, approximately 82% of algorithms used today originated from nonprofit groups and universities supported by government spending. Meaning firms using AI have been supported in their work through this innovation ecosystem. The, the data show the downstream effects of federal government supporting basic scientific research is substantial leading to economic boons. For example, after Landsat data became free and open for use in 2008, the count of academic publications rose dramatically, quadrupling between 2005 and 2017. Landsat data led to a substantial productivity savings resulting in an economic benefit of 3.4 billion to the US in 2017 alone. Finally, studies show investing in a proficient STEM workforce increases productivity as well. There are two primary drivers in AI innovation that are increasingly growing out of reach for nonprofit researchers, access to compute power and data sets. Many current advances in AI are fueled by large scale models, which are costly to train and fairly prohibitive relative to the size of the typical academic budget. This is also compounded in large part to the uh, federal underinvestment in basic scientific research. Steadily over the last few decades, the federal government has substantially reduced federal funding of scientific res uh, research. And while there have been recent, there has been a recent uptick in legislation to increase federal spending in these fields, it pales in comparison to industry. You'll note on this slide that the fiscal year budget for non-defense AI R&D announced by the White House was 973 million. In contrast, the combined spending on R&D in 2018 by five of the major technology platform companies was 80 billion. This lack of infrastructure funding has led to what we believe is an increasing brain drain in academic AI. In 2011, AI PhDs were roughly equally likely to go into industry versus, versus academia. 10 years later, two thirds of AI PhDs go to industry and less than a quarter go into academia. These trends indicate many university researchers struggle to engage in cutting edge science draining the field of a diverse set of voices needed in research. You'll note the uh, Hadron uh, Collider at CERN Research Library. It's emblematic of what uh, can come from large public investment in science. The risk of exclusively held private AI research is significant, and we are at a possible inflection point that is reminiscent to the race to sequence the he human genome where public investment in he, human, uh, the Human Genome Project preempted concerns about a private firm patenting the human genome. The financing and development of an NRC should bear in mind two key components. One, affordable, reliable, and accessible baseline compute power. 
and two, rich government uh, data sets, such as weather data from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to better predict hurricanes. If designed appropriately, a national research cloud stands to democratize access to the tools needed for AI innovation, particularly to underrepresented, uh, underrepresented groups such as people of color, HBCUs, and rural America. It will, could increase uh, the level of public science and also allow for educating students and increasing the AI talent workforce. And all this stands uh, the potential to unleash a string of uh, advancements in AI. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Professor Dan Ho. Thanks, Russell, for that introduction. Um, I'm going to talk about the what, who, and how of computing. What is built, who gets access, and how. Uh, and one of the most uh, challenging issues is this question of how an, an ambitious form of infrastructure like this uh, would get built. And the basic uh, uh, policy choice is one between publicly owned infrastructure versus use of private uh, commercial cloud resources. Uh, to date, uh, because uh, a resource like the National Research Cloud doesn't quite exist, uh, many members of the, the AI research community gravitate towards uh, commercial cloud uh, solutions. Um, and one very interesting kind of model along these lines is the National Science Foundation funded Cloud Bank project, which provides subsidized access to um, existing uh, cloud resources for NSF uh, projects. The alternative is uh, public infrastructure. Uh, think here uh, of the national laboratory uh, models. Uh, pictured here is the Summit computer system hosted at Oak Ridge National Laboratory that has um, uh, just over 27,000 GPU units and was the fastest supercomputer from 2018 to 2020. Or the NSF uh, funded supercomputing network uh, like uh, the um, Frontera system depicted here uh, at Texas um, that is open to the national academic community through the Exceed uh, network. It's worth noting here that uh, Stanford's own data uh, uh, shows that amongst researchers uh, using uh, sort of advanced computing, uh, the majority of Stanford researchers themselves actually gravitate towards the Stanford Research Computing uh, Center, uh, which has about 2000 uh, GPUs. It's still actually interestingly, perhaps for this audience, a minority that right now is using uh, commercial uh, cloud based on a survey um, of researchers done here. Uh, um, that of course uh, can change depending on how the NRC is built out. Um, there are lots of benefit, pros and cons uh, to each of these. Uh, some of the main considerations to uh, opting for existing cloud providers is the ease of access, the familiarity by many already using commercial cloud solutions, the kind of software stack uh, that's been built out, and the sort of market incentives for maintenance and upgrading of these uh, kinds of resources. In terms of public infrastructure, there is a pretty deep uh, experience already in building out existing computing centers like the Summit or Exceed uh, network uh, that I just mentioned. And I think one of the major trade-offs here that we grappled with uh, a, a bunch uh, is that it is actually at this point fairly well established that if you're facing this make-buy uh, decision, if you have fairly continuous demand, uh, it is uh, significant. It can be significantly lower cost uh, to own uh, the infrastructure. Uh, so, if you look at peer institutions in and actually including Stanford University as well, when doing that cost calculation, uh, in general, uh, uh, most universities, when faced with this choice of uh, sort of on-prem versus commercial uh, cloud have all kind of opted for supercomputing uh, centers on site. Uh, Compute Canada, which is uh, uh, a close model of a national research cloud, uh, similarly concluded that it is, quote, far more cost effective for the Compute Canada Federation to procure and operate in-house cyber infrastructure than to outsource commercial cloud providers, cloud-based costs range from four to 10 times more than the cost of owning and operating our own clusters. 
so where does that lead us? In terms of the recommendation, I think it's very, it's hard to imagine scaling that kind of public infrastructure in the short run. So one of the things uh, we recommend is that in the short run, uh, we should be expanding existing cloud credit programs like the NSF Cloud Bank. Um, and simultaneously pilot public infrastructure via this kind of NSF academic or national uh, lab model to test uh, the usability of that kind of a model. And so uh, in the long run, we may be looking at a kind of hybrid model uh, that can be informed by the results of uh, these early investments based on uh, adoption and performance. Uh, so we could uh, go to something like Japan's Fugaku system, which is now uh, the fastest supercomputer uh, in the world. Second major question on compute infrastructure is eligibility. Who gets access? And worth noting here that the, uh, in, that the legislation that uh, uh, enacted the task force for the National Research Cloud described the NRC as, quote, a system that provides researchers and students across scientific fields and disciplines with access to compute resources. And um, we uh, sort of uh, looked at a couple of different options. Um, one focus would be uh, on principal investigators. Uh, the other question is how to involve students. And then we've also heard a number of calls to actually uh, provide access to the National Research Cloud for small uh, businesses. Um, when you look at the numbers, it is very hard to imagine scaling something that would give access to all of these parties simultaneously. Uh, one count of faculty members has the number of faculty in the United States at approximately 1.5 million, uh, 20 million uh, college students uh, compared to 31 million small businesses. And so our main recommendation here is to start with principal investigators. Um, in uh, academic institutions, but it's worth noting here that we really, uh, by PIs, mean PIs across all fields, including engineering, the social sciences, humanities, medicine, and law. Um, and we're happy to, in the Q&A to talk about why we think that kind of a vision for human-centered AI is so necessary uh, as AI uh, begins to inform uh, fields uh, really across all uh, domains. Uh, uh, the uh, beginning point with PIs is also the convention for most federal grants. And PIs can, of course, also bring in students and other collaborators. Uh, but we also recommend a form of an educational pilot program to figure out how one could then move from the base of principal investigators to potentially have more educational pilots that include uh, students. Uh, the third uh, uh, question is how then do you allocate resources uh, to uh, principally PIs, um, and uh, two different uh, very divergent models uh, are, number one, you could run it like uh, an NIH or NSF grant process for every application uh, to the NRC, and that, of course, has major uh, kind of cost implications because of the amount of overhead that it would take to actually process each custom uh, application for access to the NRC. An alternative would be universal access. Uh, to all PIs. Um, uh, and what we ultimately recommend uh, is a, a kind of hybrid between the two. That is a default base level access uh, for computing uh, that should cover most PI needs, and then a kind of custom grant process for access to compute beyond base uh, level uh, compute. And that tracks most closely the model that Compute Canada, uh, the National Research Cloud in Canada has adopted, where only about 15% of PIs went through a kind of merit selection process to go beyond base level uh, access. It is also similar to the NSF Exceed network, uh, which has been uh, has also engaged in a really interesting uh, public-private partnership to provide HPC resources for COVID-19 uh, research. Uh, which is also available for almost all US-based university and nonprofit researchers. Uh, and the kind of default allocation is what they call a startup allocation that is processed uh, with minimal kind of overhead uh, in a roughly uh, two week period. So those are our, our main uh, kind of highlights from the compute infrastructure part of the report. And with that, I will turn it over to Jen King. Great, thank you so much, Dan. Hi, everybody. So I am going to talk about the data portion of the NRC today and focus on some of the big picture issues that we encountered as we tried to think through how to respond uh, to the call. Next, please. 
um, here's the call to action uh, for the NRC. And the core animating principle behind this was, uh, at least from our perspective, was not just the data portion, but as Dan just discussed, the compute and data portion. Uh, but the data piece, we think, is a very critical one. Um, so today, big data is primarily locked up in big platforms. And so the incentives for companies uh, to, like, to develop their own data, what we see often is kind of a mining of the public sphere. You have big platforms that dominate the space. You have other companies that uh, often engage in different type of, types of tactics in order to get data, um, in many ways violating issues like consent. And then you have academics who often are really on the losing end of the side in terms of the type and amount of data they can actually get their hands on. And so, um, so the core concept with the NRC was to make government data available for public research. Um, and this includes data that are in formats today that aren't accessible, um, that makes it difficult to work with, as well as administrative data. So the type of data that is used in uh, agencies such as the Veterans Administration, for example, uh, which you know, obviously has a large healthcare component and deals with you know, veterans themselves. So. Um, so we already make some forms of data available to researchers uh, it, or public data to researchers um, for many different forms of empirical analysis, st statistical analysis, and policy evaluation. Um, and it's actually uh, the folks in these communities that have been working really for decades to try to open up government data more broadly for, for different types of uh, uh, evaluation needs. So we are focusing here on, a pub on public sector data. And um, we want to be clear that we're not talking about private sector data. Uh, there are already different solutions in place for private sector data, um, and we don't feel like the NRC necessarily needs to reinvent the wheel here. Um, should the NRC eventually look into facilitating private sector data sharing, there are going to be a host of issues that we won't talk about today uh, regarding you know, intellectual property, for example. You may find that the NRC would actually have to you know, devote staff to dealing with DCMA I'm sorry, DMCA takedown notices uh, for copyright claims. Next, please. And so, um, as, as Russell mentioned earlier, uh, there is kind of a huge economic value in opening public data. Uh, we mentioned the case of the Landsat imagery. And so, uh, just as an example, the US government, or USGS, sorry, uh, used to charge $600, $600 per image tile for access to this data. After 2008, they made it available for free. Um, and that, as, as you heard earlier, really yielded tremendous uh, benefits in terms of both academic research and publications uh, and kind of just a pure dollar value in what the return is on investing in public data. And you know, through things like this, uh, there's been the opportunity to explore issues like global warming, habit modification, habitat modifications, and even global poverty. Next, please. So as we considered the data portion of this project, what we found was a set of interrelated challenges. And so first are the legal privacy issues. Um, so unlike private industry, uh, we do have some data privacy laws at the federal level here in the US, but they are extremely sectoral. Uh, in the US government, we actually have an omnibus data privacy law, the Privacy Act of 1974. And you know, one of the consequences of that law has been that it decentralized data by design. And so what you will not see in the federal government is a single repository of government data. And the NRC uh, in its vision, you know, potentially conflicts with that because of course we, many folks have thought about the NRC as a potential resource for centralizing data. And yet, you know, by design, we have an entire government data system that is extremely decentralized. Uh, next are the agencies. So what we discovered in our, on our, uh, in our research and in our different interviews and talks is that in general rate agencies are extremely risk adverse to sharing data. Uh, unless they're mandated to do so, they have no incentive in general because there's so much concern over issues like liability. Um, and even in the cases where they are mandated, they often still refuse to share data. Um, there, are also going, there are also some inherent uh, issues or problems with uh, trying to motivate agencies to share data. Part of that is a lack of expertise and resources devoted to having people on staff who can actually take data in the form that the agencies use it and translate it and make it available to researchers. Uh, another big piece of this are data use agreements. 
And the ability for individual researchers to have to negotiate access to different agencies in order to use that data. Today, that is absolutely a one-off process, one researcher, one agency, there's no consolidation, uh, there's no streamlined way of doing so across different agencies. And that's one of the opportunities we see for the NRC is to work as an intermediary to make that a much more streamlined process. Uh, finally, there's government infrastructure itself, um, which as I'll talk about in a minute is extremely outdated um, across a, a range of different agencies. But one of the other big pieces here is that there are a lack of shared principles around how to use and how to store, how to reuse data. Uh, so finally, uh, the point where these three kind of areas intersect is one where federal data policy is desperately needed to try to work across all these issues, as I'll say, not only for the NRC, but for data sharing questions in general. Uh, again, I mentioned that the more statistical research community, as well as the other you know, social scientists, medical researchers, and others that have been long using government data. Uh, these are the folks that really have been trying to push on that, that interlapping area there to work on for a federal data policy. So next slide, please, thanks. Um, so thinking through the challenges I just mentioned, you know, first are legacy systems. Um, so it's one thing for us to build the NRC in isolation. However, it will never exist in isolation. You know, part of what the NRC is intended to do is to work across the government and open up potential data sources for, for research purposes. Uh, so, but any hope of doing so will also rely on those agencies updating their infrastructure. So there is a federal data strategy that kicked off in 2020. So again, there have been folks working on this. It's not uh, just us coming to the party, um, but that federal data strategy uh, is actually operating on a 10 year horizon. And to the best of my understanding, it was not uh, created with, certainly not without the NRC in mind, but more largely without thinking through the implications of AI. And so there's potential work to be done there in terms of revising something like the federal data strategy to work with both the NRC and to rethink how you might retool government data sharing for AI purposes. Uh, another point here is that the NRC itself could be used as a leverage point for agencies you know, to the point of, if you wanna be able to share data with the NRC, then uh, you know, tying some of your modernization plans to that could be a good leverage point. Another thing we also do recommend in the report is that agencies be given access to the NRC for their own computational purposes uh, as a carrot essentially to help uh, streamline that process and move it along. So uh, what do we need to do to modernize government data systems? You know, again, uh, the NRC, I think, is very dependent on the need to do so. Uh, it's not just the NRC, it's working with these different agencies. And so part of this is doubling down on things like the national data strategy, but uh, funding just the NRC alone is simply not enough. Um, and so there's also uh, the National Secure Data Service, which is a proposal that was put forth as part of the, as part of the Evidence-Based Policymaking Act of 2018. That piece was not passed, but that is another key piece that uh, in our analysis, should the NRC come into being, uh, that particular piece of proposed legislation would really be crucial. Although again, it was written more with statistical data sharing in mind and not with a focus on AI. Uh, as I mentioned before, the NRC really needs to act as a central data intermediary between researchers and agencies to streamline that process. So, so researchers no longer have to go agency by agency to try to get access to data. And then finally, I'm not going to go into this in depth. Uh, Dan alluded to it earlier on the compute side. You know, there are many different ways one could instantiate the, the NRC. We talked about building a federal agency. We don't think that's probably the best approach at this point. We recommend an FFRDC which is a federally funded research and development center. Um, and there are many different ways to do this. You can have one, you can have many. Uh, I think one of the baseline recommendations we have is to consider having the um, National Science Foundation lead an FFRDC. In the longer term, we've also looked at public-private partnerships. Again, I see this as kind of a range of options and there's not necessarily a reason why these things are exclusive. You have to do one or the other. It's possible that you have FFRDCs and you might have a PPP for um, you know, very specific types of data or specific types of research. So it's really not an all or nothing scenario that we're proposing here. And again, a potential agency could be on the table, but I think it just has much broader implications that we would urge the task force to look into. Next, please. Okay, so I'm gonna talk for just a little bit about the Privacy Act. Um, 
because one of the first things we ran into as we began this project was the question was of, is the NRC even compatible given the existence of the Privacy Act of 1974? Can we even do this um, given the constraints of the Privacy Act? So as a reminder, the Privacy Act 1974, uh, it was a result of the power abuses of the Nixon administration. Uh, this generally is seen as a very robust and I would argue fairly sacrosanct law. I, in the discussions around national data strategy and things like the National Secure Data Service, there's no question here about uh, removing <laughs> or eliminating the Privacy Act. Uh, no one suggests repealing it, potentially reforming it, uh, but certainly not doing away with it because I think at its core, it has been successful at countering the abuses that we saw that led into it. But one of the side effects of this is that it's created an extremely decentralized data system. And so the idea of the NRC kind of holding all government data is simply off the table. There needs to be a different way of kind of approaching how we architect out the data for this uh, issue. So next slide. Um, and so my, kind of my final point here is uh, in terms of thinking through like what was even permissible? Can we even have an NRC? And if so, what form will it take? What can we do? Um, <clears throat> first, we do think that uh, a, the NRC is compatible with the Privacy Act in terms of the fact that the, I'm sorry, the Privacy Act allows an exemption for statistical research. And we think that most forms of AI research will fall under that statistical research exception. Um, we do think that in terms of privacy treatments for data, we go into much more depth in the report, but let me just say briefly that we expect that most agencies, given that risk adverseness that I mentioned earlier, are really going to expect that any researchers that engage with their data, uh, you know, again, following the constraints of the Privacy Act, which at, at minimum data must be anonymized, um, that they're going to have to use different forms of privacy treatments, such as homomorphic encryption, differential privacy. Uh, we do have a suggestion uh, in, or a recommendation in the report for instances where researchers may want to engage with raw data uh, in terms of building out vir what we call virtual uh, data safe rooms. But there's kind of a, a, a range of different proposals there, but the baseline is to anticipate that few agencies are going to be comfortable with any type of data sharing without engaging in some form of privacy protective treatment of their data. Um, and in fact, we think the most risk adverse agencies will only do so with those types of treatments. And with that, I will hand it over to Chris to talk about our ethics and intellectual property pieces. Thanks. Awesome. Um, data and privacy have been some of the most complex but important parts of our report. So thank you, Jen, for walking us through that. We'll now talk a little bit about ethics and intellectual property. Starting with ethics, uh, we want to acknowledge upfront that there are very many real and profound concerns and challenges with the way that AI techniques are being used and abused across different sectors and applications. One of the major reflections for us has been how we can start to think more critically about procedural governance frameworks for AI ethics. And needless to say, we all have a long way to go here. So one of the critiques articulated by um, HAI's very own Marija Shaka has been that um, AI ethics principles and standards are often remarkably vague. There are a bunch of standards out there that often overlap and conflict and they aren't very helpful in helping us um, make decisions and trade-offs for AI ethics. Another critique is that many of our current forms of ethics review are simply inadequate in that they aren't able to catch or identify many of the AI ethics issues that manifest themselves throughout uh, the, the deployment of AI systems um, in, their, in their life cycle. So with these critiques in mind, we've developed three recommendations for how the NRC can implement an ethics uh, review process. So uh, next slide, our first recommendation is that um, for researchers who are applying for beyond baseline access, which Dan had discussed earlier, we recommend that the NRC require these researchers to include ethics impact statements as part of their application process. We want to note that uh, this won't be too complex in terms of administrative overhead for a couple of reasons. One reason is that not all researchers will be applying for beyond baseline access. And another reason is that many of these researchers will already have written similar statements 
for submitting their research to papers or conferences. And for instance, the NSF um, requires researchers to uh, submit similar, uh, what are known as broader impact statements for funding. Second, since only a minority of PIs will apply for custom levels of compute access or data, there still needs to be a process in place for ethics violations. We therefore recommend a petition mechanism uh, to handle complaints about manifestly unethical research practices. However, we're mindful here of two concerns. The first is that of political interference. So if the NRC is stood up as a government entity, then there could be concerns around the government infringing or stepping into academic speech. And the second concern, which is very related to the first, is that this uh, petition process should be handled through a merit-based form of review. For instance, through uh, impartial faculty members or peer review panels, and not from political appointees. One doesn't need to imagine too hard, for instance, to think about a scenario where um, a political appointee uh, revokes access to the NRC uh, for all researchers who wish to do a certain type of research, uh, for instance, uh, climate, climate change. And our third and final recommendation here is that um, the NRC should enable ongoing monitoring of ethics issues that arise continuously throughout uh, the AI R&D process. And one prominent model here has been that used by the NIH. Uh, the NIH actually provides funding for embedded ethicists directly within research projects. Now, uh, moving on to uh, intellectual property. The overarching uh, policy question here is, who owns the rights to intellectual property generated using the NRC? And just as a point of clarification, the IP that we're concerned about is not the IP that researchers generate using their own private data, but the IP generated using uh, the public data provided through the NRC. So uh, there are very many uh, debates around IP incentives. Um, and given the uncertainty, we uh, recommend as a starting point that the NRC harmonize the way it allocates IP rights with the way that federal grants allocate IP rights. One prominent reason is that um, consistency and harmonization, which are themes that we've heard all morning, uh, reduce confusion and can streamline research. And then in terms of the landscape for the laws and regulations uh, for, for federal grants uh, in allocating IP rights, for patents, it's the Bayh-Dole Act. And under this act, it's the researcher that primarily holds the patent rights and the government rights to um, patents developed during research are limited. And for copyrights and what are known as data rights, it's the uniform guidance. Under the uniform guidance, the government does hold rights to reproduce, publish, and use these forms of IP. But we also want to call out that the uniform guidance is not fixed. Many federal agencies actually implement their own versions of the uniform guidance that impose additional sharing requirements among researchers. So the uniform guidance is flexible. This leads us nicely into the following question, which is, should the NRC actually go beyond the uniform guidance and institute an open sourcing requirement for researchers? There are many debates here as well. For instance, one of the downsides could be privacy and security. If researchers are using the NRC to conduct classified research, then open sourcing research outputs could be detrimental to national security. And then there are many arguments for how um, open sourcing influences innovation. So for instance, some argue that um, open sourcing is actually not very innovative at all. It only, re only results in very incremental forms of innovation. Others try to balance uh, open sourcing with downstream commercialization. And still others argue uh, very strongly that open sourcing is both crucial and actually necessary for cutting edge AI because many AI techniques such as transfer learning um, depend heavily on sharing models and sharing code. So the bottom line here is that um, open sourcing is something that the NRC should strongly consider in terms of formulating requirements and conditions for researchers to share their outputs under an open source license. Uh, and so with that, I would like to hand it over to um, back to the group and, uh, and to Russell for a time of Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, I will start with uh, one of the questions from Slido. Uh, again, uh, if uh, you would like to ask a question, you can ask that uh, through Slido. Uh, 
And the first question I think is probably most uh, good, best for Dan to ask this one. And it, uh, the question is, what fields of research would the NRC be good for? Is it mostly just for researchers who work on technical AI? Uh, thanks. Uh, it's a, a great question. Um, uh, one of the ways in which we're approaching this in part because of our perspective uh, coming from high uh, to promote human-centered AI is that some of the most profound problems are not going to be solved by purely technical approaches. Uh, so um, uh, High itself has involved 90 different departments, I think at Stanford uh, in, uh, um, in different research uh, projects. And so uh, uh, the recommendation we make in the report is actually uh, not to focus on uh, very narrow forms uh, of purely technical AI research. There would have been a very small version of uh, compute access that might have focused purely on quote unquote, unquote AI researchers. But what we're seeing right now is a transformation across all different fields. Uh, Compute Canada, for instance, is seeing a major uh, growth in demand uh, from uh, less conventional fields like the social sciences and the humanities uh, for uh, compute. And part of the aim here of rebalancing uh, that Russell uh, talked about in his uh, opening remarks is really to make sure that uh, when we're focusing on problems, uh, we're uh, not only looking at the kinds of uh, data sets that right now have been so uh, commercially oriented, uh, like advertisement data. And uh, part of the theory of impact actually is that if we can figure out a privacy preserving secure mechanism to actually share uh, data sets that really pose profound social problems, uh, there would be huge potential benefits from having uh, the broader community uh, involved in solving those kinds of challenges. That's why the Landsat example is such a compelling one, uh, because Landsat has been uh, really central to understanding uh, um, uh, 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 climate uh, change, uh, habitat modi modification, um, and all sorts of other uh, 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 interesting applications have been developed based on uh, making that data available. Great. Uh, I'm going to direct the next question to Jen. Uh, Jen, uh, could you elaborate more on the process for cleaning the data the NRC compiles, even if agencies share their data? the manpower and hours needed to make a data set usable could pose a barrier for researchers. Right, agreed. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know if I can elaborate on the process, uh, but I would certainly suggest that uh, one of the things that we call out for clearly are, uh, are the human resources, uh, that the NRC needs a staff. This is not, uh, this is not data.gov, this is not a you know, serve yourself portal in, in any way. This is a managed resource that we're proposing, and it absolutely will need staff, probably a lot of staff, um, and particularly data scientists who can be responsible for, for working with agencies to make data even usable for researchers. And I agree, this is where the kind of devil is really in the details, and that when you start working through some of these types of details, I think, yes, there, there, it, there will be substantial overhead. Um, and so I think that's just something we are trying to alert the task force to immediately, that this is absolutely a resource that will need uh, lots of people behind it. Great, thanks, Jen. Uh, I actually have another question for you. I think that's kind of probably more, a uh, little bit more related to your line of, um, given the OMB hack a few years ago, sorry, given the Office of Management and Budget hack a few years ago, isn't the decentralization of agency data a good thing? Won't the NRC data collection become a giant honeypot? Also, given uh, what you described as a lack of data-related expertise uh, in at least some of these agencies, uh, why do you think they'll insist on protections like encryption and differential privacy? Uh, thank you, Arena. I saw you <laughs> uh, pose that question in the other chat earlier. It's a great one. So first, we interviewed, one of our interviewees was a uh, victim of that OMB Act hack. So we heard directly from someone who experienced it um, on, from a, the victim end. And so we're like very aware of how, um, how crucial protecting data is. Uh, and I, you know, in no way are we suggesting administrative data in the form of you know, personnel records, I think, at this point, going into something like the NRC. Um, you know, one of the things that we didn't go over today, but we do discuss in the report, is we do suggest, at least from the outset, that 
Uh, non-sensitive data is the type of thing that the NRC should ideally launch with. Um, and you know, more sensitive data is more, much more of a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but again, we are not suggesting that the NRC should become a massive centralized data repository for all federal data in any way. Um, and I think if you look at proposals like the National Secure Data S Service proposal, it too uh, you know, reiterates that uh, you know, there is no future in the government for a single centralized database of all government data. And so, um, so I think that assuages some of those concerns. Uh, yes, we are certainly concerned that it could be a honeypot in some respects. So we, you know, we have an entire chapter on, on cybersecurity in the report. I don't wanna go through that in any detail or here, uh, but suffice to say that, um, that we are concerned about that. Um, and let me, and then let's, let me address the next point too, which is the lack of data related expertise. Yes, I think that that is a, is a huge problem. Um, that said, again, I think the NRC and potentially modernizing agencies is something that may need to go hand in hand, that you're going to need to recruit staff at agencies that want to participate in sharing data with the NRC who can, uh, who can work with data and not, not just put it singularly in the hands of the NRC. Um, but the suggestions on things like differential privacy actually come from um, my own participation in uh, a couple conferences um, and talks over the last uh, 10 months where I heard directly from both government agency researchers as well as academic researchers who are in, in that, and not in the AI space, but more in the statistical and policy evaluation space. Um, and the, at least the folks who I spoke to in this context seemed very convinced that part of what they are dealing with is a culture shift in educating, not just the agencies themselves, but also external researchers, that a world where you get access to raw microdata, for example, is the, the, the absolute smallest piece of the pie and that we're much more likely to see data shared that is synthetically generated or that is uh, deployed using differential privacy. And of course, there's such a range of data that we're talking about here. It's an immense question. And it's hard to just generalize over like what we're talking about. Um, but just to say that um, there are a number of, of folks, I would say in the government agencies today that already believe that any type of data, even internal data sharing, that just I've been talking about external with outside researchers, but even between, between agencies will require things like differential privacy or homomorphic, I always stumble on that one, encryption in order to securely share, share data between agencies to avoid that uh, data centralization issue. Great, thanks for that one, Jen. Uh, Dan, the next question I'm about to ask you is kind of encapsulate and going to encapsulate a couple of them, but it really gets to the point on access and who gets access, right? So uh, the first question here is, would the NRC be open to researchers outside of academia? And could you elaborate on our thinking as to why we chose that pathway or not? Um, and I think we might even want to go so far as to even ask the question, should it be available for commercialized research at some point, because it's kind of encapsulating some of this as well. Great. Thanks, Russell. If I could add one uh, sort of note to the question that Jen uh, so nicely answered, uh, I think in the in the uh, chapter on cybersecurity, uh, one of the, the challenges uh, of federal uh, cybersecurity has been that while we have a single kind of framework, uh, FedRAMP for cloud-based uh, uh, computing uh, for government agencies, it's a, 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 a consistent theme we heard in a number of interviews that we did is the inconsistency and in how that is applied at an agency by agency specific level. And that may actually, the current state, be increasing the risk uh, of, um, uh, the, as, you, as you describe it, the kind of honeypot uh, 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 for um, malicious actors. And so uh, we think that that's actually a real opportunity for an NRC well-staffed with cybersecurity researchers uh, to figure out how to begin to harmonize the, the vastly different implementations of, of FedRAMPs uh, that, and, and providing the authority to operate uh, for particular agencies. Anyway, to turn to, to Russell's question about access to uh, researchers outside of, of academia, um, we think it's a really ambitious undertaking as is. And one of the, the core uh, problems that we see is that it, the, the worry we have is less about researchers at Stanford who have 
uh, lots of access to, for instance, to the Stanford Research Computing uh, Center, uh, but it's really uh, about uh, uh, the transformation that AI is having across fields and the uh, increasing uh, challenges that um, uh, non uh, sort of uh, elite institutions and universities have in providing that kind of uh, compute and data access for uh, uh, researchers. Um, and uh, so that's why we start with principal investigators at academic institutions. Um, and we think that's really a good starting point to, to uh, uh, test whether this uh, kind of infrastructure can work. PIs can, of course, bring on students, they can bring on collaborators, uh, they can uh, bring on uh, uh, others uh, under uh, uh, their uh, uh, compute um, uh, allocation. And ultimately, there are these interesting boundary questions of should the NRC potentially be extended to all uh, in, uh, parties at nonprofit uh, institutions? Should it be extended to all small businesses, uh, which is something you've heard? And uh, here, I think basically the, the reason why we really recommend first starting with PIs is the sheer logistical challenges that would emerge from trying to scale an effort like this so uh, uh, rapidly. If we're talking about, for instance, uh, uh, 30 plus million uh, small businesses that could lay claim to access to compute like this. Uh, the other part that's challenging is that it's uh, uh, to the extent that you really broaden this right now, we do have, uh, we can piggyback in, on some level on the kind of federal grant making process that is tied to PIs. That is not uh, that infrastructure does not exist uh, when you're talking, uh, for instance, about small business access. Uh, so how do you rule out the kinds of uh, perverse incentive effects of very large incumbent tech players uh, spinning off uh, 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 nonprofits or, or startups? And how do you uh, 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 ensure that you don't get that kind of gaming uh, to kind of NRC resources? Uh, those are all uh, 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 sort of uh, logistical issues that could be handled, but we really recommend first starting uh, with PIs with the potential to expand if that model is successful. Great, thanks, Dan. Uh, Chris, I'm gonna give this question to you. Um, it's actually directed at you. Uh, given that AI principles and standards are currently quite vague, how can ethics impact assessments be specific? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, there are literally over a hundred different ethics principles out there. Um, during our research, we found actually that the government has um, promulgated five different sets of principles from NSCAI, ODNI, um, DOD, GAO. And I think that the question is spot on in the sense that for researchers to submit ethics impact assessments, we still want to be clear in what those ethics impact assessments should include. And um, one of our uh, basic recommendations here is we, the NRC would need to align with a lot of these existing governmental efforts in articulating, you know, what are the exact ethics um, principles that we're actually trying to advance here. And I think that, um, you know, getting into those principles and, and sort of hashing those out is would get a bit into the weeds. But to answer the question succinct, succinctly, it would require formal collaboration between the NRC and, and other um, governmental agencies to, to actually articulate a uh, plan moving forward here. But um, I'd like to open up the floor as well to, of course, Russell, Jen, and Dan, in case you have any additional thoughts here. I'll just add um, that, yes, they are vague. Um, and part of what we focused on was uh, building out a process for researchers to uh, actually work through the process of trying to answer these questions. You're seeing this right now at different ML conferences uh, that researchers are being asked to do this type of work. Uh, I would say it's in the very, very early stages, uh, but I think it's a really important process to introduce. Uh, another piece of what we also recommend are, you know, to the extent that the NRC can potentially either fund or at least encourage the use of other types of um, Kind of ethics proposals such as embedding different ethicists in projects you know trying to create funding models for that 
so that if you have a group of computer scientists that don't normally work in an interdisciplinary environment or work with folks who work on these issues, that you have somebody who they can work with. And this is something we also are doing some amount of experimenting with uh, at Stanford presently. Great. Uh, I think we have time for this last final question, and I'll pitch this to everyone. Uh, it's quite a, an important one. Um, how are you envisioning public-private partnerships in the long run? Would we shift to a purely public cloud infrastructure or continue to use private cloud services as well? Or would private uh, partnership focus on contracting for support maintenance while the hardware is publicly owned? I'm gonna call it Dan and then we'll just kind of go along and uh, see how everyone can address this. Uh, sure. Um, I, I think uh, um, the exact long-term configuration is something that we hope is going to be informed by early investments of the NRC. So uh, recall that our short-term recommendation in terms of infrastructure uh, is to simultaneously uh, invest in expanding programs like NSF's Cloud Bank program to uh, simply because in the short run, it's easier to scale up. Um, it can take two years, uh, if not longer, uh, to build a new supercomputing uh, cluster if you go through a kind of contracting process and whatnot. Um, uh, and then uh, we will see, based on uh, uh, sort of demand and, and performance, uh, how uh, well the, the public uh, side of this uh, uh, works. Um, uh, and there's, uh, and uh, as a result, I think that will inform the kind of long term uh, uh, strategy. Uh, in all instances, one of the key uh, sort of dimensions of this is also going to be enabling forms of cloud bursting. That is, if you provide base level access, there's always going to be projects that, you know, need to be able to kind of scale uh, in for the short term to, to kind of burst onto the cloud. And so I think that's a, an important design uh, dimension to, to pay attention uh, uh, to as well. Um, uh, but maybe uh, lastly, to kind of address uh, this idea of the, the public-private partnership, we have a number of different case studies uh, in uh, the report. And one of the kind of interesting models that we point to is what was seen to be a pretty successful model that involved uh, a number of different government agencies, uh, uh, private uh, uh, companies, uh, and academic institutions around the sort of HPC COVID-19 consortium that provided very large scale forms of compute uh, uh, for uh, pandemic uh, response. Uh, so uh, that is a potential uh, kind of public private uh, partnership model that uh, one could think about. I'll add, you know, we have some very specific recommendations on the white paper, uh, and I will just kind of speak for myself here to say that as I've thought about this over the last 10 months, I think that um, flexibility is really key. Uh, you know, we do basically do, you know, allude to that in the report, but um, as I was speaking earlier about the different forms that the NRC could take, I think it's important to realize that, you know, what we're suggesting is not an all or nothing proposition and that uh, you know, we may see different types of uses, different types of kind of use cases around data that would suggest that there are, you know, multiple ways to instantiate this thing, and it may not have to be a single NRC. And, uh, you know, one thing that could drive that, for example, uh, are the types of tools that are available for researchers, um, you know, especially the folks who work uh, on ML research. Um, you know, you may, we may find that there is um, a challenge in moving people off commercial services because they become very used to those tool sets. We may find other people who are very willing to kind of take up maybe open source tool sets and, you know, really work within a different environment. So I mean, I think there's a lot of different kind of aspects to this question that, uh, you know, we haven't talked about today, but, you know, part of this will be kind of uptake by the researchers themselves um, and, you know, what they find I think works best for them. Um, and I think that's why being flexible and how we work forward is really important so that you can anticipate that you may have some researchers that will just only want to potentially just use cloud credits and you have others who may find that for their research needs working on a, a public cloud is actually optimal. Great, well, I think we're right at time. So I'd like to just take a moment to thank everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank Stanford Law School and Stanford HAI, the staff, the students and the faculty.
Uh, again, we encourage you to read the report. Yes, it's length, lengthy, but we hope you will and uh, take a uh, at least read the executive summary and take um, a look at it. And uh, we welcome any future questions um, on this. And thank you, everyone, for attending the seminar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.